Today, we're going to be discussing the National Public Data Breach, which most people heard about this in the month of August. Today, this particular breach is actually one of the most significant data breaches in history and involves the personal information of 2.9 billion people. USDOD is the one who actually took it, according to many sources. Some of the information that's actually contained in it is highly sensitive, like people's names, their addresses, their social security numbers, as well as their date of birth. And in some instances, this information actually dates back 30 years plus. As if it wasn't bad enough in some cases, there's also information linking family members together. Initially, the data was posted for sale for like $35 million. It's available for free today. When I posted my last video with the tool that downloaded data breaches, USDOD took it down really, really, really quick. As a result, I'm not going to share where to actually source this data from, but instead we'll look at it from a different point of view. Instead of trying to get the data, we'll just use a third party site that allows people to freely search through the data to see if they've actually been exposed or their family members have been exposed, kind of giving them the ability to vet and see um, if they need to go into lockdown mode and to protect themselves, their credit, or their loved ones. And I think this is a good approach because this also makes it so that you don't actually have to worry about downloading breach data from a threat actor. And I really want to give out a massive shout out to a really good friend of mine, CWade12C, for sending me this link and letting me know that basically anyone can check with no registration and for free and without giving up really any more critical information that is necessary to actually do the search. And the beauty of this is that in three seconds, you can see if your information is exposed and get some advice on how to at least try and do something proactive for your security. National Public Data faces multiple lawsuits, including a class action lawsuit in Florida. The lawsuit says that the company failed to implement adequate security measures to protect the information that they collected and scraped from personal information from non-public sources without people's consent. And we're going to see some massive identity theft and other crimes resulting from this breach as a result. I would definitely expect to see additional legal actions against national public data and additional scrutiny on how they actually handle it in the overall security of their systems. So let's get to actually doing a search or two. We don't have security teams protecting us 24 seven. We don't have dedicated security experts ensuring that all our informational security and our overall operational security is always tight, right? Like who does though? To judge how screwed the rest of us are, basically, let's look at some of the people who have the most security in this nation. We'll look at Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and we'll see if their information was actually in this data breach. If anyone's data is secure, it's probably the last two presidents, right? Okay, so right off the rip, we can see, you know, national public data. Well, we'll put in... First name, last name, state they're from, and birth year. Boom. Okay, Biden's in there. So you can see his stuff. You'd see, you know, name, DOB, address, city, state, zip, phone, SSN. All that stuff's going to be in there. So we'll go plug in Trump. First name, last name, state they're from, or state they're in, rather and birth date and keep in mind you know you can change up the actual birth date and the state because sometimes you don't find results and you have to switch the state also maiden names are also a thing here but you can see there's this stuff as you can see even these two men with the most security in this country basically more or less um governmental security anyways are absolutely exposed to this data breach at some level so let's talk about how to add security to our everyday lives by trimming loose ends and, and sharing some basic OPSEC for our clear net lives. And right off the tip, some essential advice we saw on the site was to freeze our security. And this includes using Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion to do so for free. If you saw that little 
snippet at the, the bottom. It said that taking the step prevents new creditors from accessing your credit report, which in turn will make it more difficult for identity thieves to actually open accounts in your name. Obviously a good thing. If you contact all three individually, you won't have to pay anything, basically. Another important note that freezing your credit doesn't actually affect your credit score and doesn't prevent you from going in and, and unfreezing it at any point. Like, you can still get your free annual credit report. If you're looking at getting a credit card or something else like that, uh, and you require access to credit, you can lift the freeze by using a PIN number. But all of this was already covered on the site. So what other advice can we actually give to help you be a little bit more secure? Monitor financial accounts. I've talked to a lot of people about this. Not everyone has an Experian account or another form of an account to review their credit details. Uh, most responsible adults review bank statements, credit cards, and bills. Still, I've noticed uh, throughout this, talking to people about this specific breach that many don't review their credit history, unfortunately. And I would say early detection of transactions you didn't actually do can absolutely help you. And a great example of this is um, in Frank Abagnale's book, a great example of how, for example, cyber criminals can benefit from you waiting. When writing bad checks, he knew that the Federal Reserve Bank confirmed the validity of the checks by using the routing system, which they have, which involved a particular lag time that he referred to as flow time. And this delay allowed him to basically cash fraudulent checks and then move the money before the banks could actually catch up with the transaction's authenticity. And by exploiting this lag, he effectively outpaced the system. If he wrote a check on the East Coast, he would change the numbers so that the check would have to be routed to the California branch of the Federal Reserve to actually be verified, which obviously would add a week or two of flow time. And this meant that he could cash more fraudulent checks and was actually more likely to get away with it because he had more time to escape before authorities were actually notified. And in this case, more or less, he was robbing banks. But the principle of flow time absolutely still applies. If you catch things early on, you're much better off. And there are a bunch of services that will assist you with things like this, like Credit Karma or Mint. And I'm not endorsing them. You need to do your own research. Identity Theft Protection Services. There are more than a few places that actually provide the ability um, to have your personal information monitored in real time and alerts sent to you of suspicious activities. And many of these services also help assist with things like recovery of your identification or documentation when trying to assert that there's actually been fraud in a particular case. The point of these services is real-time monitoring. Most halfway decent ones will actually include some kind of insurance for identity restoration, kind of like Experian. Offhand, without me doing like super in-depth research, I would say like LifeLock, Identity Guard, and Bitdefenders um, offer, from what I've seen, identity theft protection. Those are the ones I know of offhand. I'm not endorsing them or telling you to get them. Um, all in all, like you need to do your own due diligence because it could just be good marketing, right? Your threat model is absolutely unique to you and you will need to figure out what kind of protection you need or want to be able to be safe. I personally can't tell you how to do that. Um, I can throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and hope that some of it sticks, which is the point of this video. Passwords. Yes, I know what you're going to say. Um, and using the password ABC123 is definitely not a good idea. I know this is also very elementary, basic advice, but it's important to cover. And my advice to you is to not only make your password unique, but also make them extremely long. My typical password consists of anywhere from 50 to 150 characters that are alphanumeric, use special characters, employees upper and lowercase, and is about as unique as I could possibly make it and includes special characters. And each password for each site is unique. That last part about each password being unique for each site 
is extremely important. And I know I'm preaching to the choir that most of you all do all this as standard practice. Still, for that one person who watches this video that doesn't actually do this, I suggest that you look into some of the services that are out there that you can use to easily manage your passwords. Whatever you do, don't use LastPass. Seriously. If someone put a gun to my head and said, tell me where you would suggest for a password manager, I would have to say key pass offhand. Um, when you use it, it won't actually update though, like you see with some other password managers. And I've heard of people saying things like you can use key pass with strong box for their, for your phone and end up having an auto sync feature that basically keeps key pass up to date via SF. TP. So basically, whenever you get home or whatever, it would update if it's that original network. And a less complicated method that I would advise would be to like sync it via Nextcloud or something, so long as you're the only one who actually gets to control it. Remember, wherever you save your database file with KeePass needs to be extremely secure. So if you're shaking your head right now and saying, this is all way too much, I'm not doing any of this, then I advise you to go and make an account on something like Bitwarden. You should also donate to them or get the premium service if, if you can afford it. Bitwarden is open source, so the code is publicly available for scrutiny uh, with audits. And this allows different security experts to audit the code for vulnerabilities and basically ensures that the application is absolutely reliable and secure. And this is really good because... Open source software is generally more trusted in the security community as it goes through continuous review by independent experts in the community as a whole. And again, I know there's a ton of you that are advanced users and this is way too elementary for you. But again, this really isn't just for those people. I'm targeting the people who actually need advice like this in this video. And the other thing about Bitwarden that I like really think is is pretty awesome is that it's cross-platform and this means that when you're on windows it works if you're on mac os it works um when you're on your linux box it'll work um android or ios or anything else you're gonna have an easy time but you can even install it as a browser extension if if that's the option that you personally have uh, or the only option that you personally have um, they also have a web-based vault that you can use should you need to do that and maybe you don't have install permissions or something. And Bitwarden uses end-to-end -end encryption, also known as E2EE. -E. So the EU will probably hate it. <laughs> like This means that even if someone intercepts all the data that's going across your network, it remains encrypted and secure, making it impossible for or very, very difficult for unauthorized parties to actually access your information provided they don't have access to a quantum computer offhand. One of my favorite things about Bitwarden is that it's free, right? Because I'm cheap. Uh, the free version absolutely has excellent features to it that make it worth using. For example, you can enable uh, two-factor authentication or 2FA, which will allow you to easily integrate with things like Google Authenticator so that you also have a second authentication method that can be used in addition to the password. On the portable app, you can also use biometrics, like a fingerprint to unlock the vault. They also offer self-hosting option. And in any case, I'm getting kind of distracted by rattling off about Bitwarden specifically. But my point is, if you don't want to go through the kind of headache of doing some of the uber secure local file database stuff, like a whack job like me implements, you can absolutely still use 150 character passwords and get away with it. You can still have the option to use a unique one for every site and not have to remember it every time. Have the ability to auto fill in uh, with Bitwarden, which I saw some security concerns about in the past. I'm saying that, I don't know if they're fixed, but I just wanted to let you know that. When you visit a site, you still don't have to remember. So when you visit a site, you still don't have to remember your passwords. And it's also quicker than actually typing out a username and password in the long run. So not only is it more secure, but in addition to that, it's also faster. So there's really no reason not to utilize it. And storing your passwords is absolutely essential, which is why I took so much time to actually cover it. But the other thing that you really need to remember is to change them. If 
If your information is in this data breach after you check it, I absolutely advise that you change all of your passwords immediately. Like, pause this video and go do that. Um, this kind of might seem insane, but if you've never actually done it, then you definitely owe it to your own information security to go do it right now. Um, furthermore, you should also look at your exposure level and then decide if you want to implement changing passwords as a regular thing that you do on a monthly basis or a weekly basis or a, even a yearly basis. Just do it. MFA. So much of the time, MFA or multi-factor authentication on the dark net is called 2FA or two-factor authentication. And this is another outstanding way to try to lock down your various accounts. Basically, what this means is that even if your username and password were exposed and someone got it, they would still need an additional method to be able to access your stuff. I have no doubt that 90% of you are already familiar with this, but for those of you who aren't, it may be a text message with a specific code or a Google Authenticator code that regenerates occasionally or a hardware device. And this is like a whole other topic that I could definitely go off on a tangent on, but I promise you I won't. If you can enable multi-factor authentication on literally anything, you should always, always take advantage of it. And like, I totally get it that it could be a pain to go and like open up your phone or your authenticator app or to find that drive um, and get the text and put in the, the number and stuff. But it's really a good last line of defense. So the added couple half a second or whatever in inconvenience, even if none of your information was in the data breach, it's worth it. Dark web monitoring. So there's a ton of companies that provide this. I'm not going to endorse any of them um, just because I think a lot of the companies that are out there, it's just nonsense. If you have good informational security and OPSEC, then typically you're not going to have to worry about this. I think that the dark net and the deep web overall is a great scare tactic for a lot of companies. It's like a when when someone gets broken into in your neighborhood, now all of a sudden you get a phone call from an alarm installer. Oh, we're doing a special in your area because they know you heard about the news article about five people's houses getting broken into in your neighborhood and you're much more susceptible to advertising in that way. Well, if, and they're basically, it's like the mafia shaking you down in, in, in a way where it's going to be a monthly fee. And I just, I dislike it altogether. I'm not a, really a fan of it. And again, like I said, if you're on point with the things we talked about so far, you're probably going to be all right to some extent. But we'll discuss this dark web monitoring anyway. Like some of the selling points that you see with it anyway. Um, like in a perfect world, we wouldn't really need to even have this listed. So for you that don't know, like criminals that steal your data basically need a place to sell it. And there are a ton of them. <laughs> Various services offer the ability to go and check to see if any information is listed in various data breaches that occur. Unlike the tool that we showed earlier, many of these dark web checker tools are pay to play. And typically you can find these tools nowadays baked into other tools like Experian, um, I know they have one that exists, but I've never actually used it. I'm not vouching for any of these um, on or like giving recommendations. I'm just saying that they exist. And periodically you should maybe check sites like Have I Been Pawned or see if your information is in other data breaches. FTC. So you should also consider filing a report with the Federal Trade Commission if your data is in there. Uh, basically... Suppose you suspect your identity was actually stolen. You'll want to file an identity theft report with the FTC in that case. The report hopes to create a document that basically um, lays the groundwork for you to point to theft should you get into a dispute with a creditor and have to face legal action after the fact. Crying in court that your identity was got stolen X amount a month ago and them saying, well, if it wasn't you who bought those $1,500 shoes, who was it? Really, when you're in that position, it's really just not going to cut it to try to get them to take your word for it. You're going to want to be able to 
verify it with some form of documentation. And you can visit their site and file that report for free, from my understanding. Just follow the steps that are there, and they'll also help you create a recovery plan from what I saw on the site initially, which is great that they don't just kind of leave you in the lurch. Fraud alerts. Much of the time, sites like Experian will have these kind of by default, and you pay extra to get better ones or access to more features, but setting up fraud alerts on your credit reports will allow you to warn potential creditors that they should verify your identity before actually issuing any credit. And this helps to prevent thieves from opening up new accounts in your name. You can contact the three major credit bureaus to place fraud alerts. Once they're set up, the alert will automatically apply to all three bureaus, uh, email and social media. So you're going to want to take really particular precautions when securing your email and social media. So for example, if you have questions set up for an account recovery that you want to ensure those answers aren't something someone can just look up. Uh, for example, if it asks you like what your mother's maiden name is, if you put the actual name, anyone who does a basic genealogy search can potentially get the answer to that question and therefore have one of only maybe a few keys that they actually need to fraudulently gain access to your account. And this is a significant problem. Don't give people the keys to your email or bank account or other accounts by using your real info like this. Like this is one of the few times you don't want to be honest. Um, it begs the question, like, how are you supposed to remember fake names, fake answers to these security questions? And in that, it goes back to our password section. Both KeyPass uh, and Bitwarden have the ability to make notations. Um, and this means that when you set up your security questions, you can put any answers you want in along with the actual questions that they've asked and have it saved in your password manager. Should you ever need that information, you'll have it. Should an adversary try to exploit your accounts um, and get in using freely available personal information, they'll have a hard time, or even better yet, it'll just be downright impossible for them. Doing this absolutely eliminates an entire attack vector. And there are a ton of less clever threat actors that actually employ that methodology that I described. So right now, what could someone do if they were to get access to your email, right? Like, answer that question real quick. What kind of private information do you have in your email? You know, this is exactly why ensuring these things, specifically your email and social media, are absolutely locked down as tight as possible. And that's really why it's so important. Education. This is probably the most important thing. If you don't understand what phishing is or social engineering, then I highly suggest you look into these things and educate yourself. Uh, according to a variety of sources, these two methodologies are the predominant attack vectors for a lot of threat actors. So it's absolutely imperative that you understand them. And I'm not going to get into these things because this subject really, really gets deep, but you owe it to yourself to educate yourself about these things. Deletion. So if you have an account that you haven't used in years, you should hop on and terminate that account. For example, if you get an email from a place that like you registered an account on five years ago and haven't logged in since, like take the time on a Sunday or whatever uh, to go through and log into these accounts and terminate them permanently. These are essentially loose ends that you really don't need. There's a variety of collateral attacks that can utilize these abandoned accounts to create what looks like authentic presence for you. In addition to these collateral attacks, reducing the number of online accounts linked to your actual personally identifiable information decreases the risk of data breaches just in general. You should also review things and set up permissions for your Google account, for example. Your Google account has a whole security section that allows you to see every application that has access to your Google account. 
at any point in time. You can remove those permissions for those apps. In addition, you should also review your Google account to ensure that it's not saving all your history and that your exposure is absolutely as minimal as possible. Ideally, you shouldn't even have a Google account, <laughs> but it's a it's that's a whole side issue and and I'm not going to get into that now. And I'll admit I'm absolutely a hypocrite for saying that because I have one. Lastly, I would say don't just like do these things and forget about them. Do them and continue keeping up with them. Typically when things like this happen, people tend to get very nervous or scared and implement all these different changes. And then a month later, <laughs> they're back to not really caring uh, and using unsecure passwords. And now they're disabling their MFA because it's a pain in the ass. They don't have to get their phone out every time. Don't be one of those people. Use this as an opportunity to increase your informational security awareness and your overall operational security posture. Um, if you like this video, leave a like. If you are not subscribed, please hit that subscribe button if you feel free to do so. And I will see you in the next video.